yeah, in at least two two uh, versions. And um, again, just look at the thumbnail as an indication, but um, nothing. Not, you don't have to copy it exactly. Um, and then the second one, uh, you are to bring in actually two pieces. Um, I forgot. It's actually not just one, but two more things. So. Part plus element. Uh, yeah, I don't think it specifically says that you have to use yeah four or more. So I would just pick you know maybe I mean if you want you could have two balls and two cartons and another element just like it's shown here. But you can also have you know one ball and a carton maybe three other things. Uh, you know depends on how you feel. Um, so I'm just going to go through some notes which in part apply to today's uh, and in part more like to the environmental um, thing that we're going to do. Um, and I can't remember, I think there is a link to this demo about line weights from Professor Natata. Um, I can't remember if we talked about it already, but it's just showing again how you can create a volume by differentiating the line, which is uh, pretty straightforward. This looks, because it's using pens, you know, obviously it's a little bit uh, too much and I don't want you to go this far yet because you're really drawing and you want to like, you know, learn how to draw, right? Uh, when we get into markers, we'll probably do more of this. But once again, the way this is structured is that the outline of this object is dark, it's the thickest. Then the line that shows, uh, the line that's a, a border between uh, a surface that's seen and a surface that's not seen, that's a, a middle weight, we call that number two, and then a line that shows uh, as a border between two surfaces where they're both seen is the thinnest line. Uh, very, very schematic, but kind of a nice way to uh, frame it. Uh, these elements are more from uh, it, the, the MyClean um, notes, and I forget if those are already online, but um, and a lot of this refers to the drawing of uh, uh, organic objects. Uh, essentially, what it says is that you should, uh, if you're doing organic things, you should uh, chisel your pencil so you, you make it really um, like a scalpel. Uh, this pencil is a little bit hard, but. Um, so that you have a shape like that. Okay, so the point is, oops, the point is shaped like that. Wow, this is interesting trying to draw by looking at the screen. Um, all right, rather than being actually pointy like that. Uh, and so what happens then is if you do that, Take a softer pencil. You can turn, turn the pencil, and you get this nice and very squiggly line. And so the division is between what he calls dead things, uh, which might be objects, and alive things, which might be trees, people, and um, yeah. More examples. Okay. So I don't know if anybody's going to do a flower in this particular exercise, but if you were to do a flower, you might want to um, play around with this. Okay. So you turn around and your line is nice and, you know, it's fuzzy and, and it varies too. Once again, one thing you can try on these drawings, and that's what that student did, Sophia, is to uh, start out with pencils which are uh, quite hard at first, maybe an H or two H, and then move on to uh, softer pencils uh, to make darker lines. Uh, these are just, again, applying that idea of the you know, squiggly line to organic hoops, to organic shapes. OK, 
Okay, just a word about shading. I don't know how much shading you're going to do yet in these drawings. Uh, if you do, uh, here's some basics. Uh, and, you know, there's a little bit of controversy about some of these techniques. But uh, one thing for sure is that uh, if you're going to apply shading, you have to be uh, conscious that if you have your lines being really, really dark, and you're shading inside those lines, it's not as dark, then all of a sudden, you know, it almost looks like painted in, quite like that. So in this version, you know, the strokes are almost the same as your, the same as your outline. So it has a more kind of uniform tone, the drawing. Um, when you do your cross edge, let's call it, uh, once again, don't do this, and don't do this. I mean, I know there's going to be cases in which you want to break the rules, but uh, instead, do this. Like deliberate, separate strokes. If you want to make it darker, just make them closer. Okay, that will give your drawing a nice, like, crisp look. Uh, in terms of lighting, uh, of course, you kind of have to decide where you want your lighting to come from. And um, even though, for example, in this case you have the light coming from the right, you might imagine that the right side of this cube may be light. Well, we're still giving it some shade, otherwise it looks all the same, otherwise it looks like washed out. Um, and you'll notice actually that there is a little bit of shading even on the top of this guy. Just because, again, completely blank would be kind of dead. Um, and then of course the, sh the part that's in the, sh you know, in the darkest area is, is the one where you uh, don't, don't, let's see, something that I did here is I changed the direction of my stroke and that's actually not that good. If we can, we want to try to keep um, the strokes at the same angle. Okay. It's a kind of abstraction that's telling me, okay, that is, me is meant to signify value. It's not a feature of the object. Um, and of course, that contradicts this. But um, and then, in terms of uh, different values between the different surfaces, you want to be again. You don't want to be too contrasty. You want to go from like a hundred percent to zero percent because it just tends to bleach out and, you know, become completely dark. Uh, what you can play with is about values that are about twice as dark as the one before without starting at 100%, right? Because if you start at 100, then you're forced to do 50 here. Uh, instead, if you start maybe with, I don't know, maybe 40 or 60, then you go 30, 15. Uh, just a couple of techniques, again, from my clean. Uh, these are kind of funny, which is like, again, the kind where you can sort of talk. And so if you say you want to make a cube and you want to keep your pencil down, so he calls this go and hit, hit and go. And then when you hit, you just kind of <laughs> keep drawing until you know what you're going to do next. And Okay, now I know, now I go. So it's a very... Um, should I say, kind of mantra type of thing. You just, you know, keep doing that. And you have to admit, it gives, you know, it gives a nice, fresh, fresh look. So that's go and hit. And so when you get there, you stop. Um, I think what he's saying is that in a, lot of, a lot of times drawings have sort of their own character because, you know, if you did a drawing completely with this technique, it would be coherent, right? I mean, regardless of what it is. Um, I think what he's saying is try not to mix too many different styles. Uh, cross your lines, absolutely. That, that helps, I think, to make the drawing a little more interesting. Don't do that, because that's like, uh, what's happening there? I don't know. You know, very architectural. All these tips are like really, really architectural tips. 
but of course, you know, designers, industrial designers, who were they? You know, 50, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, they were the architects, right? I mean, they get to do all the good stuff, everything. Uh, a little whimsical things, what he calls professional dot. So you do a cube, let's say, and then you make a little dot at the end. Uh, just to kind of give it a little, you know, accent. Of course, you don't want to do it on every corner, otherwise it starts to look a little funny. Uh, and then what he calls the professional gap. You just you do your lines and you leave a little gap. You know, again, just making your lines a little more human. Um, if you have a gap in a curve, um, the best way to uh, place that gap is between the, um, let's see, when the curve changes direction. Okay? So this is, you know, you might say that's part of a larger shape. That's part of a larger shape. So where they kind of, where they kind of switch, that would be the spot to do your gaps. Um, this is already going into uh, placing a background behind your object to kind of highlight maybe or make, make the part that a little light stand out more. Uh, and this is definitely something we'll do in, uh, you know, with markers later on. And I think it's called a vignette. Uh, you just you know, you just place it there and it gives it, you know, it gives it a dimension. I mean, you know, the simplest thing you can do is this. You know, you just stick a line behind your object and get that automatically says, oh, okay, maybe there is, it's either a wall there or maybe there is nothing, but this is maybe a, a surface, right, that this is sitting on. Um, this doesn't apply to these drawings because it's about color, but one of the reasons you want to do your etching as crisp, clean lines is because, um, especially if you do a second color, it allows for the white of the paper to show through. Uh, the color, unfortunately, on the screen is terrible, but um, well, it's not too bad. But in the video, you'll see it. Well, actually, in the video, you won't, you won't see the zooming in. But so what's happening is you get not only you get the mix, you get two things. You get the mix of the colors by overlapping, right? So I don't know what this is: purple and yellow and green. Make I'm not sure what. Um, but because you've left some white in those spots where you left the white, you know the color is pure. And so what will happen is that the mix, of course, happen happens in your eyes. Right, so it's a, it's a little bit, one analogy I have is like when you have a, a multi-track recording and you have lots of instruments, but you want to separate them, right, on separate tracks, so you can, you can hear them all and they're, and they're clean, but there's like maybe eight things going on at the same time. Same idea, you know, you don't want to have eight instruments on the right channel and eight instruments on the left channel, right, that's all that's a big muddle, right. So lots of things, but distinct. Uh, just a sketch on how to create gradients by varying the distance between your strokes. You know, you have your drawing, right, which you're going to turn in. Um, I think the way to look at it is don't, you know, do your drawing, boom, and then you turn it in. Um, I think the way to work is to really do lots of sketches, you know, and this can be on cheap paper, I mean, you don't have to use like your good paper. Um, so you do lots of different things uh, without worrying about, oh, is it finished now, you know, is it, is it ready to go, can I turn this in? It might turn out that one of these is like your best drawing, right? So do lots, and then maybe based on this you do your final, or just turn in your best drawing. Uh, don't think of, you know, the assignment. Because the idea is you really, you know, you really want to practice a lot. Um, okay, I don't want to make this too long. So what I'll do is I'll show again a couple of examples from a couple of really great people, and um, and then maybe if I need to come back here, I will. But um, I just want to show more Andy again. Uh, again, he did like bottles pretty much most of his life, and um, and one of the nice thing he said once was that there's nothing more abstract than reality, you know, because it was figurative at the time when everybody was doing abstract art. And I think what he means is that your drawing is an abstraction, right? I mean, everything we do, 
on paper is really not the thing. Uh, so what he aims for is like a kind of a character or a sort of sensibility of what these things are. Um, you know, these are bottles, you know, still life, which is like natura morta in Italian, which means, you know, dead nature. Um, and yet, you know, they're, they're, they're dead, but they're kind of very much alive. They come alive because of your marks. I just want to point out to one thing that he does, which is counter to everything that we've been taught in design school and, and sort of uh, perception psychology. There is this thing in Gestalt called, it's one of those laws, I think it's a, one of the depth laws, and that is that if I do something like this, you see this as flat, right? But it could also be that this is, you know, four objects placed in a certain way, you know, maybe they're like, you know, two cubes on top of the other. So if I draw, let me just say this, let's do that. Um, but all of a sudden, if I do something like this, you know, all of a sudden you see depth, right? So the, the theory goes that you never try to align objects um, with the features of the object aligning with the features of the other object because you lose this idea of, you know, depth perception. And interesting enough, that's exactly what he does. You know, he's a genius, of course, but it's, it's really, really interesting. I mean, he puts this object right behind this one, and if you look at these cubic things, it doesn't even give them an edge on the sides, you know, a, a side. It just goes straight up, and it's like almost like a flat picture, and yet it works. So, uh, so you don't always have to do, you know, exactly. Uh, you can experiment, of course, before, uh, you know, going totally wild. Um, so, this, I think, is already posted on iLearn, and it's some sketches from this uh, German guy or Swiss guy. And once again, you know, use a lot of construction lines, a lot of, um, we haven't really defined this, but these are contour lines. Uh, contours, of course, are uh, on a topographic map. These are your contour lines, right? And then equal space, but then changes in the elevation, right? So this would be something like that. There's an interesting story about the guy, the French guy who invented contour lines. They were doing some surveying and he just started to see like all these numbers were all the same around. You know, they were taking elevations and then he said, oh, what if I connect the dots? And invented this. Um, okay, so one thing you probably should do still in your drawings is uh, use from elevation drawings and plan drawings. So if you place your objects on a plane, uh, I think it helps. Say I have a bottle here, and I have a cube here, and maybe I have, you know, another bottle here so on its side. By doing this little view, I think I'm going to really uh, know, you know, how to draw the rest. One thing that you can play with, and you know, maybe this is a little bit more advanced, but is uh, uh, making objects go inside each other, you know. So, what if your curtains become, you know, two shapes, two like houses-like shapes, and they um, go inside one another, you know. What if all of a sudden, you know, maybe you have something like that. What would that happen? It'd be interesting. As simple as it looks, it would be actually quite hard. So you would start with the first one. Um, and then the second one, because I have the plan, I kind of start figuring out where is it on the plan view, where does it, where does it go? So it's, it's there somewhere, so it's there, so it comes out uh, about diagonally, right? So that's my diagonal. So, okay, so it's there. Take that point from this middle point, um, and you can see right, right away I have a, a very you know tougher angle to deal with, right? One that I may not be prepared for, but still. So it's probably probably less. Um, 
So now that I have established this, uh, you, you go by progression. You, 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 you use what you have to figure out the second one. So let's say I do this, and I have my base here, and I've got this crossing point. That's, that's the point in which you know, my bodies, my two bodies kind of you know, uh, penetrate each other. So if I go up here, this meets my thing here. So you can see, I'm going to have fun here trying to get that cross, you know, that connection because that's not a that's not a simple one. Um, and it's looking a little funny, right? I mean, it's looking like it's falling, uh, but still, I'm going to kind of bite the bullet and see if what I can do, even with. I mean, it really is what you make the drawing to be, right? Since nobody's going to see your original, you know, who says that it's wrong, right? Um, okay. Um, otherwise, yeah, just do this. Do a little plan view, maybe do a little elevation. If you're still having trouble with your um, ellipses, practice those, okay? So remember that however you orient your ball, uh, you have to go perpendicular to that. So if I make a bubble here, make a bubble here, it has to be like that, okay? With these lines going perpendicular. It can't be like this. Right? That's not good because what that is, is a gin bottle or, you know, vodka bottle, you know, one of those little things you put in your pocket, which you might want to draw, right? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, maybe that's, that's what you want to do, but if, if that were the case, you see, it looks a little funny, right? Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's still somehow, it still looks wrong, I mean, even if, if it's squished, because, you know, it would have to be something like that. Well, let's see. Let's, let's try. How would you do it if you have... That's a round ball, right? If that's round, my shallow line would have to be inside this. Yeah, I see. So no matter how I turn it, I really want to do it. Um, I mean, you would have probably other clues as to what this exactly is, but... Okay, I'll stop here and I'll come around and help you guys out and if there's some questions maybe I'll come back.